This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello, my name is John Bleasdale. I'm a writer and film critic, and today I'm going to be talking to Jake Blake Ficera, who is the author of two books of interviews that he's made with um, composers of film music for horror movies, entitled Scored to Death and Scored to Death 2. If you enjoy the podcast, please remember to like, subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter at Dr. John T. D. R. J. O-N-T-Y, but before you do any of that, please enjoy the conversation. You know, I, my road to the score to death books is, a, uh, is, is in a lot of ways a long one in that when I was in my teens in the mid 90s, I discovered the music of John Carpenter and my first soundtrack that I bought myself probably at least in the horror field was in the mouth of madness I saw I saw that film with my friends at a my birthday sleepover and we used to make a lot of movies together on VHS with my mom's VHS camcorder and uh, at the time it was the mid 90s and so it was a lot of Quentin Tarantino ripoff type stuff you know <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then we yeah and so we were very much doing that kind of thing uh but it was a bunch of you know 15 16 year olds and whatnot we watched in the mouth of madness and that opening track which was originally tempted with the uh when he was editing enter sandman by metallica so it's this hard rocking thing that he redid for that uh and it just captured both mine and my friend's imaginations. And that night at like four in the morning, we made our, our first horror movie with the end credits of that playing in the background as the background music, because that's how we did it back then. We didn't have editing systems. We just kind of filmed and, and did that. Uh, flash forward a few years, I went to film school at a school called SUNY Purchase, which at the time was probably one of the best undergraduate programs. Um, it was just outside of New York City. and we shot on film and edited on flatbeds and uh, from day one, kind of, it wasn't even like we had to wait till we were seniors or something. The, but the the benefit of going to a film school for me anyway, um, was one location being just outside of New York City and two being surrounded by people my around my age that were also really passionate about film. My friends were to a certain extent, but they weren't enough to try to pursue it uh, the way I did. And it was a tight knit group every year. I think they, they allowed, they accepted like 30 students into the program, maybe and then less actually showed up. So 20 some students. And for me, the big benefit was becoming friends with these people. Cause then you start to share the things you've seen, the things you're interested in. And then as well as going to class and, and seeing film history, you just, you know, at that age, you're just a sponge. And so uh, people had seen some of the Italian horror stuff and, and, I just got very, I just submerged myself in horror also at that time, because one, I, I consider a, per, a perfect storm of things. I was in school with people and some of them were into horror movies and they introduced me to horror movies that I hadn't seen before. Uh, Joe Bob Briggs's Monster Vision was on TV and I didn't have cable at home, but I did at school. So I started watching that uh, living just outside of New York City. I had access to video, the kinds of video stores that I didn't have access to in the suburbs. Everything came together. Anchor Bay was releasing uh, Lucio Fulci movies, George Romero movies, remastered. It was just kind of a wonderful time to be a horror fan. Uh, it, the internet was still kind of new to me. This we're talking like 97. So uh, I didn't have the internet at home. I'd have to go to the uh, college library. And uh, when I kind of discovered the films of Dario Argento and Lucio Fulci, I also discovered the music of Goblin and Fabio Fritzi. And uh, for me, there was no turning back from there, you know, with uh, John Carpenter, Goblin, Fabio Fritzi, 
these i was always kind of into film music you know i love john williams growing up like so many kids my age my dad listened to film music so it never seemed weird to me to like film music but these guys was uh, was a different breed of film music it was a different it was a kind of film music that was more equated to pop and rock and the kinds of things that i could listen to my own so i just kind of fell in love with it then so we're talking late 90s stayed obsessed with goblin uh, in 2000, they reunited with Fredara Argento for a film called Non Hosono. They put out an album. Simonetti put out an album with a band called Diamonia, which he created, which he reworked a lot of the Goblin and some of the Keith Emerson stuff and Maricone stuff for that they did for Dario Argento into more of a hard rock, heavy metal thing. And I just loved that album. I was I would commu- I didn't have a car and I would commute two and a half hours every day for work. I was editing educational films and I didn't have MP3 player then. We're to, now we're talking about 2001. So I had, I, I dug out a Walkman and I bought a blank cassette and on side A, I had Hollow Notes' Rock and Soul Greatest Hits Volume 1. And on side two, I had Daimonia's Dario Argento Tribute. And I listened to it every single day. <laughs> it was like Hollow Notes in the morning. <laughs> Daimonia on the way home. It was like it covered all my bases. Whatever mood I was in, I, you know, I was just satisfied. So then I just stayed a huge fan. Around 2013, and this is what I talk about in the preface of my book, uh, Goblin, a version of Goblin that was really technically called New Goblin, but when they came to America, they were just called Goblin. And it was half Goblin members, original Goblin members, and half Daimonia members, which was Simonetti's band from the early 2000s. And they came to America and I saw them in Brooklyn and it was kind of a dream come true, something I'd never thought would happen. Uh, And it just, it ignited the most intense addiction to that music that uh, to to date, up to that point. And I was just obsessed with learning more about the band. And when I discovered that there wasn't a whole lot of information, at least here in the States, I discovered that there was a book in Italian. Somebody had written a great book in Italian called uh, Seven Notes in Red or whatever the Italian translation is that. And since then, it's been translated into English. But at the time, there wasn't anything. So I was like, I need to find out more. So I decided that I was going to reach out to Claudio, who I had reached out to as a fan a bunch of times in the decades before that. But, um, and I wanted to interview him. So then it was like, okay, so what am I going to do with this interview? And just kind of slowly in late 2013, we're talking October is when I saw the band was for Halloween. So November, December, I start thinking, okay, I want to reach out to him. I want to interview him. What can I do with it? You know, I love John Carpenter. Maybe I could interview John Carpenter. Maybe I could interview somebody else from the band. Maybe I could interview Fabio Fritzi. And suddenly this idea started to formulate of like, maybe I could put to get put together a collection of interviews. So I started to uh, read books of interviews with composers because I said to myself, I, you know, I'm a musician, but my knowledge of film theory is limited. Um, let me see what other people are doing. So I started reading other books of interviews. And for the most part, I got discouraged because a lot of them were kind of very heavy in music theory. And I said, well, that's the, I can't do that. Like, I don't speak that language. So maybe I'm not the guy to do this. I uh, conversed with my buddy, Dave, who I lived with in college and who we geeked out over that music together. And I said to myself, if anybody would read a book about this, it would be Dave. So let me ask him what he thinks. And so we talked about it and I came to the conclusion, like, hey, I'll do two or three interviews to see how it goes. And if I don't feel they're good enough for a book, if I'm not the right person to do this, I'm sure I could persuade a horror movie website to let me post a truncated version of those interviews so that they'll live in some way on a, on a website. Thinking that most people would say no, you know, I put together a dream list of composers I'd like to talk to. Thinking that most, most people would say no, I asked five or six, seven composers and they all said yes and so uh suddenly it was like okay it was going to be a 
the idea of doing a couple of test interviews went out the door because now I had five or six people. So I said, okay, I guess I'm, I'm going to try to write a book. And uh, the first interview took place in January of 2014, which was Harry Manfredini. The very next day I interviewed Alan Howarth. And then uh, a couple of days later, after I read the interview, I, I listened to the interview and transcribed the interview with Alan Howarth. I interviewed Alan Howarth some more because I was still finding my legs of what it was going to be. I just remember uh, Harry Manfredini, who was the first one, and he's the composer who's best known for the Friday the 13th films. I emailed him and I, I found his contact information online. I emailed him and I said, I'd like to interview. I'm, I'm starting a book. He said, how long do you think it's going to be? And I said, I don't know, 45 minutes, maybe an hour. And he's like, oh, I'm going to talk a lot longer than that. And so Harry and I talked for two hours, maybe more. And that interview, I'm actually very thankful that his interview was the first one because that interview is the one that set the pace for the rest of the interview. Um, had I done an interview that was an hour long, half uh, 45 minutes long first, I might have said to myself, you know, this is the pace. This is what these interviews are going to be. But Harry and I talked for so long and it was so interesting. And he's such a fascinating guy. And we talked in depth about so much stuff. It was like, okay, I guess like this is, this is the bar for the rest of them. And uh, so then I was off to the races and uh, over the next, I don't know, two years or so after that, I was working on uh, the book that eventually became score to death conversations with some of our greatest composers. Uh, after that, I wanted to right jump. I was so into it. I wanted to jump into the next one. And my, my, publisher was like whoa 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 you know slow slow your roll <laughs> like let's see if anybody wants us kuya jets <laughs> yeah uh, but i really wanted to keep going uh and then i so i waited a year they said let's wait a year so i waited a year and then they were said well uh we think we're gonna not do a second one so then I said, well, my work in this field not done. What else can I do? I had been doing a podcast with a good friend of mine for, for a couple of years, uh, starting in 2004. Just kind of soon after I started the book, I started doing a podcast with a buddy of mine. I had guested on his a podcast he was doing with some friends of his, and we enjoyed talking about movies. He and I went to film school together. So I had known him for 20 years, uh, almost 20 years at that point. Uh, we were freshman roommates uh so he, he's like a brother he's one of my best friends and uh so i said well I'm, I'm doing this stuff in podcasting i had done a lot of guest podcasting in promotion of the book when it get the first book when it came out so then i started doing score to death the podcast which was kind of a continuation i was interviewing more composers but it was an audio version uh after doing that for a year some things occurred that i don't think are really worth going into but needless to say the publisher came back around and said, hey, you know, do you want to do, I, I told them I'm going to do a second one and I might be doing it with another publisher if you guys are okay with that. And they said, well, you know, maybe we could do it here. And so I ended up doing it with the same publisher who I loved working with on the first one. I thought they did a really great job with the book. And uh, so the second book ended up becoming half the interviews are interviews that started in the podcast most of which have updated information. Uh, so I did, you know, I interviewed them and then I interviewed them again more in depth or updates of what they were doing after we first talked for the second book. And then the second half of the interviews was just all new stuff specific to the second book. So that's how Score to Death 2 happened. Excellent. But I mean, one of the things that I really appreciated reading the book was the fact that you were putting all of these different people together. And although they're interrelated, you know, Alan Howarth, writes music with John Carpenter and, and, and works on his films. A lot, some of them are very, very different and, and uh, are very far apart. Um, but, but because you put them all together, you, you, you sort of see links and you see sort of different methodologies, different approaches, different attitudes. And it, it's just really interesting to have those interviews all, all you know, uh, in one place. Yeah, when I started, it didn't really... You know, it wasn't my plan that I was going to ask them all the same questions. And I don't. For, I mean, I, there's a good portion of them where I ask them all the same question. And a lot of them I don't because a lot of the questions are specific to the movies they worked on, the filmmakers they worked on, etc. The book, more than anything, it's kind of under the guise of a horror movie book. But it's really mostly about the process of it's, it's like celebrating the, those composers. You learn about them personally. And then it's kind of learning about the process of creating music for film and how they all approach it. 
And the majority of the movies that we talk about just happen to be horror films. And then some of the questions towards the end of those interviews kind of lean more into like, well, what makes horror music different than uh, other types of film music and, and things like that. But it wasn't my intention that I was going to ask them all the same questions, but I was getting such good answers to so many of those questions. And then some of those, and then I would maybe tweak those questions as I went on and I saw what people were saying. It really was this wonderful evolution, the edit, the interview style. <laughs> <laughs> that went into the book we had that have had an evolution as I saw what was working and what wasn't working and uh, the questions that weren't getting the kinds of answers I, I thought were worthwhile enough to put into a book where there was restrictions of time and, and space so I started editing as I went along yeah absolutely the things that I find fascinating about a lot of the questions when I ask them a lot of the same questions are not just the differences, but the similarities. You know, I found in the first book, I found very much there were two schools of composer. There were composers who were more classically trained. They maybe went to school for it. A lot of them taught it. They learned how to compose. They learned how to conduct an orchestra. And those guys had a very different, those guys had a very different way of writing from people that were more rock oriented. But the people that composed with classical training composed in a more similar way. And the people that composed who came from a rock and synth background was more of an improv improvisational style. So th I, those questions became about that. And then when I went into the second book or even into the podcast and I started talking to people and I started you know, gearing questions toward that, I found that the second book has a lot younger, you know, the, the proportion of more current, younger composers is greater in the second book, you know, because I, when I did the second book, I was trying to figure out, well, what can I do that this first book doesn't offer? The first book was very heavily weighted in 70s and 80s composers with some guys from the 90s and 2000s. So the second book becomes became have more weighted in people that were younger or working today, their heydays today, uh, with some guys who are you know, older. This is like a kind of a balancing act of how can this book be different? But because I was interviewing so much younger guys, I found that there was a lot, the, the, the line wasn't as clear with how they composed. There was a lot, oh, well, you know, I do a little bit of both. It was a lot of, I do a little bit of both. So suddenly everything that I thought I kind of knew from doing the first book, a lot of that wasn't relevant for the second book. So it was just a, a a really interesting process, you know, not just, you know, you're saying having all these guys in a collection, but diving so heavily into this style of this brand of art and music in five or six years time interviewing the books contain combined 30 composers, but then the, 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 podcast also has a bunch. So we're talking about upwards of 40 composers that I interviewed over, I don't know, since two, from 2014 to, you know, 2018, 19, something like that. So it was, a, it was pretty heavy. And so it was a lot of information and it, be, it was a wonderful process. And yeah, there was a lot of interesting things about, you know, if you put up the, the bullet, you know, the, the cork board, the bulletin board, you start to pull out the yarn, you know, like a police investigation. Serial killer is here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> of process and style and, and, and uh, collabor collaborations and equipment, especially. What I found in the second book was I, I, I became friends with somebody who I work with. I work, my day job is as, as an editor and producer for television. And I was, I became friends with a story producer that I was working with on a project. And he was, he came from Pittsburgh and he was a huge Romero fan. And he was a big horror guy. And he's also a musician. So he was way into the music. So uh, he, he brought a copy of my book when I told him about it. And he's the one, his name's Mark. He's the one that said, you know, I'd love to know more about the the sense they were using and i said oh okay so when i started doing the podcast and the second book people will notice that i ask more questions about the specific equipment like what synths we're using what samplers what drum machines uh because i found through the process after the first book promoting it going to horror conventions with the book to sell it talking to horror film fan, music fans for the first time really because i did the first book in a bit of a vacuum being on twitter con conversing with the film music fans, I started to learn like, okay, this is the kind of information they're looking for. The first book was the was information I was trying to find out. And now this, I'm going to dedicate some of the second book to the information that I, these people are saying they want. So the second book becomes, we do talk about equipment in the first book, but the second book, it gets a little more specific about it. It's so interesting as well. I mean, I have a similar experience doing my this podcast in that I feel like I've done a crash course in film books 
because I've been reading so many film books and talking to people. Uh, do you feel like you've learned a heck of a lot? Oh, yeah. You know, I certainly more than I ever would have imagined I would learn. The, you know, if you talk to teenage me, whether it was after I saw John Carpenter, after I got into John Carpenter music or after I got into Goblin and you said, hey, you know, in 20 years, you're going to write, you're going to interview all these guys. And people are going to think of you as an expert <laughs> in this kind of music. And I was, I would have thought I was crazy. And when people kind of talk, you know, talk to when people, you know, mention that they think of me that way, they ask me to come on to talk about something because they think I'm an expert in something. I always just say, you know, well, let me just read the books and you too can be an expert. You know? <laughs> it's, it's all that. I'm you know? learning. I'm learning with you. I'm learning. <laughs> No. Yeah, like I, everything I know about it is stuff that those guys told me. I didn't leave anything out. I mean, there's some, obviously the books are edited, but you know, for the most part, you can know everything I know about it too, just by reading what they told me. Absolutely. I mean, and you, you're, you're meeting some of your heroes. So you meet, or you're, you're having conversations with some of your heroes. Like, and I was really interested in a John Carpenter interview because I've, you know, I've had, uh, I've never interviewed John myself, but I do have friends who've interviewed him and who have said, He's uh, he's he's kind of a short answered guy, and he sort of has this. And I uh, and I thought your interview was really good because you really you kind of didn't let him just give short answers. You kind of pushed him a little bit on some stuff and got and got some really interesting material. Yeah, I mean that was by far the most intimidating interview. I mean he was that still is probably even more so now my favorite director of all time how i met dave who i mentioned earlier who i ran the idea of doing the book by who i lived with in college how i met he was in the film program but he was a year ahead of me so when i was a freshman he was a sophomore when i was a sophomore he was a junior but when you're in film school and you start talking to people other film students and you know one of the natural things is oh so what kind of stuff are you into who's your favorite directors and i would say john carpenter and everybody would say oh you got to meet dave because <laughs> Because <laughs> Dave was, uh, John Carpenter was Dave's favorite filmmaker. And I was on the set for a student film and somebody came over to me and said, you know that guy, Dave, he's standing right there. So I walked over to Dave. I said, I hear you like John Carpenter. And he laughed. And uh, then, you know, months later, we lived together. It was kismet. Uh, so John Carpenter was, had been such a huge part of my life. He was the reason why Among Goblin and Fabio Fritzi, but I mean, one of the real inspirations for the book, for me wanting to do the book. So I was so intimidated. I had the great benefit of interviewing him. The, I did two interviews with him for the book. And, the, you know, they're not separate. They're edited together within the one chapter but the first time i interviewed him i asked him did you would you ever think about doing an album that was just an album not a soundtrack you know just an album with music and that question got eliminated got edited out of the book because six months later he announces that he has an album coming out so and then when that album lost themes came out Indeed. you yeah, the seed, Dave, man. Dave, dave's convinced of that but i I, I have I'm skeptical about about the origins of, of that, but um, but when Lost Themes came out, then Lost Themes Two came out. He did a ton of press for it. He was on every blog, every website, talking about music so much so that by the time I was able to interview him again, because I said to his assistant, you know, like he told me he wasn't doing it. The book's not out yet. I would love to talk to him about it so that I could be as up to date as I can be. By the time I talked to him. It, the second interview and the first interview were night and day. I had the huge benefit of talking to him in depth about his music before anybody had ever talked to him at that length about his music before. His music in the interview, the way he talked about his music in interviews before that was always a couple of questions about the Halloween scene. You know, it was always a second part the second thought to the rest of the interview. But I interviewed him specifically about his music for like I don't know, an hour the first time, maybe a little bit more, 70 minutes, 80 minutes, something like that. And he was, I just felt like he had a good time, which is something I totally didn't expect. Like we laughed up together. I used the word diegetic and he's like, I, the word, I had never heard that word before, which I doubt very much, but, <laughs> but he, he was laughing at me for using the word diegetic and not diegetic. There's a funny part that's obviously not in the interview, but he, something happened. He's like, Oh, can you hold on a second? I'll hold on one second. And he puts me on hold and his phone had this very creepy, like eight bit 1990, early 1990s music on it. That was like within the phone, uh, which I had never heard a phone do that before. 
but he came back. He's like, okay, oh, hey, sorry. And I said, John, I have to tell you, that's the creepiest hold music I've ever heard. And he started laughing. He's like, yeah, I don't know how to turn that off. And I, I, and I isolated that. I cut that out. And I sent just that bit to a couple of friends of mine because I thought they would find the music funny. But everybody's response was like, he sounded like he really wanted to get back to you. Like they, they all focused on the fact of like when he was like, when he put me on hold, how he, you know, wanted to really get back to the conversation. I didn't, I never really thought of it that way. So I just got very lucky that he was very into it because I don't feel like he had ever talked that much about music before. And of course, when the interview was done, I was disappointed because it, his interview does just doesn't feel like the other ones. His The way he thinks about music, or at least then, because he wasn't a rock star then, now he's a rock star. Quite literally, the way he thought about music was, the, was an afterthought. You know, he directed the movie. Then after he had a cut of the movie, then he sat down and he did the music. Whereas a guy like Harry, Harry Matrini, Chris Young, any of these other guys in the book, like that's their primary focus. If I was to have asked John Carpenter it, when I did the first interview, what do you do for a living? He wouldn't have said I compose music for horror, horror movies or movies. I wouldn't, I'm not a film composer. He would have said I make movies or I'm a retired filmmaker or whatever. So he just doesn't think about music the way the other guys do. And he's not educated in it the way the other guys are. So he just, I don't think he has the vocabulary to talk about it the way the other guys do. So when the book was, when the interview was done, I was disappointed because I just felt like I didn't get enough. Like it, it's like, he's just, we just didn't get, get into stuff as, as, as in depthly as I wanted. But then I read it and I transcribed it and I sat with it for a while and I said, you know, but this is the most information about his music that I've ever read. And I've read every John Carpenter book there is. So I had to kind of take the consolation prize, which is like, I didn't get what I wanted, but there's no interview up to that point that is better about his, at least as informative about his music as this one. So, And what was the second interview like? You said they were like night and day. Oh, yeah. So the second time, by the second time I interviewed him, he talked about his music on everything. Right. And I swear to God, he was playing a video game while we were talking. Like he was just over it. He did it and he was cordial and he was nice. But he, he could tell now he had stock answers for things because they were the same answers that he had said. I mean, I talked to him mostly about the album that had come out or was come. Yeah, I guess by that point it was out or it was just about to come out. And I did ask him a few questions about some things that I wish I had asked him about the first time, like in the mouth of madness. And so a couple of follow up questions and other things, but it just he was over it by that point. He was tired of talking about it. You know, he had done so many in such a short amount of time. And even his assistant was like, I don't know, you know, he's he's kind of over it now. <laughs> What's your favorite uh, Carpenter then? What's, what's your, if, I mean, if that's not too sort of asinine a thing to ask. Score or film? Film. Well, you know, in a lot of ways, they're my, they're my children, man. So I don't know. <laughs> the house is Ten on fire and you can only get, you can only get one. <laughs> I do tend to skew, I, I have always, I have always kind of, as much as I love Escape from New York and Big Trouble Little China, they live and stuff. I've always been more pa even more passionate about his horror movies the thing i mean i mean it's really a masterpiece you know I, it's funny because when i was getting into horror movies my dad who considers himself an intellectual uh especially when it comes to things like cinema and he is to a certain extent he's you know he's a lawyer and he's well read and he's read every you know classic novel there is and but uh it was so funny that he was so down on horror movies when I got into it because so many of the horror movies that I loved were movies that I saw with him. You know, he had this thing called the VCR in the early 80s and my parents were divorced. And so when I'd visit him on weekends, we would rent movies. And I, you know, I didn't have that at my mom's house and I didn't know anybody else that had that at that point. And so I, I remember seeing The Thing with him as a kid, Christine with him as a kid, because that was, you know, poltergeist, you know, the, even though I was like six, that was, it was the 80s. So you didn't, you know, there wasn't, oh, you're too young to see this kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, and you've got the thing is, of course, being scored by Ennio Morricone. And I was always curious about how that came about and how that happened. And of course, in the book, you you addressed that. I was really pleased to sort of find out that Morricone essentially, Carpenter sort of said, could you do it a little bit like me? And and Morricone <laughs> just basically did a did one of the best John Carpenter scores I've <laughs> ever heard. I mean, not as in a score for a John Carpenter film, but a yeah. score by John Carpenter. Well, you know, that's... it's. Look, you know, if there is, I feel like genre films, for the most part, are the place where you can really point to the auteur theory. 
yes, of course, you can talk about Scorsese. But in a lot of ways, the films that you're talking about when you talk about a Scorsese film are genre films. They're not horror. It's not a horror genre. But, you know, so when you start talking about the auteur theory, when you talk about directors who have a, you know, a very specific personal stamp on their movies, when you see their movies, you know it's them. They're dealing with similar subject matter, the way they look, everything. Guillermo del Toro is a perfect example, even though Nightmare Alley is not dealing with fantasy. It's actually like the anti-fantasy film in terms of, of uh, content it's, and subject matter. When you watch it, you know it's him. John Carpenter is kind of the king of that, you know, and he made it clear with the deal he got with, Har- with Halloween, I'll do it for X amount of dollars, blah, blah, blah. And it will say John Carpenter's Halloween at the top of the movie. And I think almost every movie, if not every movie after that, start. it's John Carpenter's The Thing. John Carpenter's The Fog. And part of that, and I asked him, because I said, look, you know, you've always said, why did you, when people have asked, why did you do the music? You always said, well, I was the cheapest and the quickest. And I said, but by the time you get to, you know, The Fog, Escape from New York, you know, look, you know, Sean Cunningham, was not working with a lot of money and managed to hire Harry Manfredini to do what's now a pretty iconic symphonic score. So, you know, you could afford, I could understand with maybe Halloween and Assault of Precinct 13, but once you've had a couple of hits, once you've had a hit with Halloween, you can afford to hire somebody. And he was almost irritated by the question. He's like, okay, I know what you're saying. I get where you're coming from. And he, he admitted that it was just another way of him to have control over the film, another way for him to put his stamp on the movie. And so, it's kind of you call him out on his bullshit there. I mean, because it, it is because it is kind of bullshit. Because the, the proof is, the scores that he writes are brilliant. You know, that, and and if they weren't brilliant, then okay, I was cheap and I was there and I was easy, I was quick. Fair enough. If if they were if they were sort of patched together and amateurish, but the fact that again and again, you know, he it's not just like he fluked with Halloween. They're, yeah. they're all good, you know. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't know them as well as you do, but but uh, yeah. Escape from Escape from New York, The Fog, Assault on Precinct Thirteen, Halloween, yeah, all Christ- fantastic. Christine's great, you know. All like all of his scores are great. I mean, absolutely. And you know, so I, I part of my intent that you know when I went into the books, there was a couple of things. Like it was, I want to create, I want to do the definitive interviews with these guys. So in in a lot of ways, it was like, okay, what answers what what are the stock answers when Harry Manfredini talks about the ki, 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 ba, 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 and Halloween? He gives a reason. It was because of at the end of the movie. Yeah. Friday the 13th. He has his answer. So I was like, OK, I feel like I need to include that question. When you go to a concert, even if you're the biggest of Billy Joel fans and you don't really care about it, you want to hear the deep cuts. You also want to hear you know, you want to hear Piano Man at the end. You want to hear, you want to hear the greatest hits in, in addition to some of the deeper cuts. So that was kind of the way I approached it. It was like, okay, I need to get, I need to get the greatest hits. But I also, I took them, I said to myself, but maybe I can get them to go deeper into it than nobody's ever said. So I definitely had part of my mission was, yes, there's stock answers, but what's deeper than that? So when I asked Carpenter about that question, it was like, okay, I get that. It makes sense. But other people are doing, are, are hiring people with less money. So, so it's not really surprising when it comes to, he hires a Neil Morricone, who if there was a Mount Rushmore of film music composers, and Neil Morricone would be on it. I mean, you know, some of the greatest scores of all time, one of the most celebrated composers in, in the in the uh in cinema that when he gets the score <laughs> he, he says yeah thanks but can you make it sound like me yeah, yeah. The few more, <laughs> he, i love the thing he says about you know can i have some less notes you know? yeah fewer <laughs> fewer notes yeah, it's not like it's like uh, the emperor in Amadeus telling Mozart, you know, the human ear can only hear so many notes. But it's it's. I mean, he does. Ennio Morricone seems to understand immediately what. Okay, you want this, and I can do that. But not not only can I do it, and it not be a pastiche. I'll do it, and it will be one of the best scores you've you've never written. You know. Yeah, and it's also you know he talks about the way they did it, which was. You know, basically, Adam Cohn sent him cues, and then he worked them into the movie, which was a very Italian thing. That's the way throughout the 70s, 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, the, all the guys from Goblin, Fabio Fritzi, that's the way they did it. They made, they saw the movie or they read the, read the score or they, they read the script 
they saw a cut of the movie, but then they went and they recorded music and then the filmmakers or the editors just cut it in however they wanted it to be cut in. So that's kind of, so it's also a way of, film, of scoring that I'm sure Neil Morricone was totally comfortable and familiar with, even though he hadn't been doing it. He probably, actually 82, he was probably still doing it for a lot of Italian movies by then. I've just, I just interviewed uh, Giuseppe Torratore, who's just made a, a very big documentary on Ennio Morricone. And he, one of the things he said in terms of skill is he doesn't have, obviously he's writing music, he doesn't have digital technology. He doesn't have a deck that he can just use and just time things and fix things in post. He has to write something which is 43 seconds long and it, and that's it. And once you've got that, there's not much you can do with it. You, you, you're just using that. So it's re- very, very precise and very, very, you know. So it's just really interesting that that's the, you know, that's the way Goblin are doing it as well. And, and Yeah, there was a, there's stuff about process that I never would have imagined talking to, um, I think, Jay Chataway, who uh, was pe- probably best known for the horror fans as the composer for the movie Maniac, the 1980 version not the the remake which i interviewed the composer of the remake for the for the second book rob yeah but uh maniac was such an uh, iconic score for me dave introduced me to that score when we were in college uh and i just loved that score so when i started doing it and when i started writing the book i was like i need to talk to jay chataway jay chataway is probably best known to most people for writing uh music for like Star Trek The Next Generation and all the iterations of the, the Voyager, those kinds of Star Trek shows. But for, uh, you know, crazy people like me, I know him for Maniac and Silver Bullet, <laughs> which are two of my favorite horror films. But he talks about it more in depth, but it gets mentioned a lot in the both the first book and the second book that there was this book called, I think they called the Newsom, Newsom book, which was a book that, that film that composers used that translated beats per second into frame rates so that they could figure out like, you know, cause they, a lot of them were not scoring directly to picture because it was low budget. You know, what we were just talking about with the new Morricone and the Italian style, a lot of the lower budget horror movies to just this, the technology didn't exist to make that easy. So it's okay. They would watch the movie and you know, three seconds into it, I need into the score. I need a big punch, you know, a big hit, uh, suspense, ambience. And so they had there were the, they composers had these books where they're like, okay, so t- uh, the the uh, piece of music we're going at you know x amount of beats per second. Film runs at twenty four frames a second. So how many seconds do I, <laughs> you know, it, it, there was a lot of math involved, <laughs> which I never would have. I mean, it's, it's kind of genius when you learn about it and you're like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. And wow, that, what an interesting thing. But you know, I didn't know anything about that until they started talking about it. But then so many of them, that's how they had to work, you know, to kind of calculating because they weren't looking at the picture, but using, using formulas, (laughs) algorithms for music to film. And, and to go to, to the, the sort of, uh, second sort of group of heroes i guess the 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 goblin guys who you are uh you know you just for our listeners you're wearing a goblin t-shirt as we speak (laughs) so in case there was any doubt of your of your uh closeness to the to the this music i mean i love the goblin stuff i love the the dario argento jolly and the and suspiria uh in fact i was i was reading your book on the on the uh, train and I immediately sort of put Suspiria on my um, on my phone on to, to to play it while I was while I was reading. Um, I mean, it must have been great talking to those guys. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a there's a language barrier, and I would have loved to interview more of them. Uh, and I try, you know, like I made an attempt. I reached out to them, and um, Maurizio. Gu- um, Maurizio Gorini is in the book, but Massimo Morante, who's the guitar player of the original lineup of Goblin, and Fabio Pignatelli, who's the bass player. I really wanted to interview them too, and and they were kind of game, but it was one to be one of those things where I had to send them uh, questions, and I actually did that with Fabio Fritzi for the book, and I did that with the Japanese composers who are in the second book because of the language barrier. Uh, and it ultimately just didn't work out. I think I sent them questions and I never heard back. And uh, I would have loved to talk more of them about, uh, about, I would have loved to have talked to them because 
I think at least in America, when I was getting into them and for decades, I don't know what it's like now. The internet kind of changed everything and social media, especially in terms of, you know, what we all know and the movies we know, you know, I, I joke around that like now, you know, uh, I Inferno is on, you know, t- television, you know, Dario Arshendo's Inferno, <laughs> you know, but back in, you know, when I got into them, you know, you'd be lucky if you found a copy of it anywhere. Uh, <clears throat> but I, there was this, there was this conception that, <clears throat> excuse me, there was this thought that I felt everybody just assumed Claudio Simonetti was Goblin. Because Goblin is what people attached themselves to with Goblin is the synthesizers. And he was the keyboard player. And so I think everybody's, he's the lead, he's the head of Goblin. He's the leader. He was the main composer. And it's not true. I mean, he was a member of a band and they wrote those scores together. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, Fabio Pignatelli is kind of the lost, you know, he's the hero. He's the real hero of that band because he, after Massimo Morante left after Claudio Simone left. He kept that, he kept it going and he did some of the great scores in the eighties that we know them that, you know, have now become more popular uh, since they started touring and the kind of this resurgence of, of horror film music has happened during while I was working on the book and especially after. So I think, you know, it's clear that Fabio Pinatelli had a very strong creative hand in, in all of this. <coughs> And, you know, so I wanted to talk to that because I felt like there was so much more about what we all think about the music than, than the, 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 there's so much more to it than I I think we all think about it. But of course, Claudio was great. You know, I, you know, I I was a fan of Demonia. I was, he, he continued to work with Argento after he left Goblin. So there was a lot to talk to, to him about both with Goblin and, outside of Goblin. Maurizio Guarini was interesting because he now lives in Canada. And so he's a little more comfortable with the, with English. Uh, and he was touring with them when I saw them. He was, he's also a keyboard player and he worked uh, as a session musician on a lot of uh, horror movie scores that weren't even Goblin. And you come, you come to find out later with the book, Seven Notes in Red and you, you kind of, you come to realize that, and even some of it's talked in my book with Fabio Fritzi that, uh, with my interview with Fabio Fritzi, that a lot of, they all worked as session musician on tons of scores. It was part of their deal with their record label, who was a film music record label. So that, you know, they work on the Fabio Fritzi stuff for Lucio Fulci. They work on horror films. They work on non-horror films. And it was interesting to get all into, get into a lot of that, but I didn't know a lot of it. So I wish I could have you know, dive more into it. But yeah, I mean, it was fascinating. It, you know, horror, Italian horror music is a, is a different breed. It's a different style of filmmaking, uh, the way they approach it, the sensibilities are different. And the way they made the music, the equipment they used, everything is kind of different. And it shaped film music in a lot of ways. I mean, in a way, it's, I think more people know Goblin now, but, you know, my mom wouldn't maybe know Goblin because she's heard me say it. But for the most part, you know, like it, it's a generational thing now, you know. The- Sorry about that. I, I just, I forgot to turn my phone off. I'll cut that. I'll edit that out. Or I'll keep it in. Maybe, maybe it'll be. <laughs> maybe. He's in the house. He's calling from inside the house. <laughs> but uh, they, they inspired Carpenter. Carpenter has said that, you know, he, he saw Suspiria and that's one of his favorite movies, one of his favorite scores. So, yeah, I mean, up to that point, now, like I said, there's this book that's released in English called Seven Notes Red. But at, the, at that point, there really wasn't anything available in America. And Maurizio Guarini was interesting because he was kind of an on again, off again member. And I, I, he even says like he was never at that time through the 70s when he worked with them in the 70s and then again in the 80s. He was not even an official member of the band. He never like signed a contract to be a member of Goblin. He wanted to stay separate, even though he worked with them. I think he's even uncredited on uh, Boyo Omega and Patrick and some of the late 70s, early 80s stuff after uh, Claudio Simonetti leaves. It's just it's a very rich and complicated history that now has been had more light uh, shed upon it. But at the time, there really wasn't. So, you know, I, I took great pride in being someone to bring at least some information about those guys to uh, horror movie fans who just 
like I said, there was a lot of legend, a lot of legend stuff, <laughs> you know, urban legend. A lot of had people had assumptions. You hear things, you know. Got to ask Claudio about. You know, there was always this. Oh, they wrote all this music for Suspiria that Argento used on set, and you know, and that he would blare the music on set <laughs> to frighten the actors into submission. <laughs> And so I asked Claudio about that, and and he said, yeah, we he did. I, we did write a bunch of stuff based on the script, but when the movie was cut together, we realized that none of that music worked for the movie. So they had went and then re-recorded what is now probably their most famous score, Suspiria. So yeah, it was, look, I mean, for a guy who, like I said, I was completely obsessed with them uh, off and on. When I saw them in 2013, even probably leading up to that, because they had released a live album from Live in Rome a, a year or two before that, which I ordered a bootleg, not a bootleg, but I ordered an imported, you know, vinyl and CD from, of it from Italy, which cost a fortune uh, at that, you know, uh, and I just was, it's just, let's put it this way, for, from 2013 through 2016, Obviously, because I was working on the books, I didn't listen to anything but horror film music because I was researching. But but even when I listened to music in my spare time that wasn't research, I listened to Goblin. So for, you know, like three years straight, if I wasn't listening to something for research, I just was listening to Goblin. And during that time, they put out an album or shortly after that called Four of a Kind because they reunited and toured again without Claudio Simonetti. Uh, it's just, those, look, it's band dynamics. They they have a, they they love each other, but they they can't work with each other. Even Claudio in the interview equates it to being, a, you know, it's a, it's a, it was a marriage. And when they came back to do uh, Sleepless, Non Hosono for uh, Dario Argento in 2000, he said all the same things came up. He was like, he equates it to being, it's like you get divorced, then you try to get back with your wife, with your ex-wife and, you know, still all the issues are still there. Sure. sure. Um, and Dario Argento has a week, uh, has a, a new film uh, being shown right now in the, yeah. in the Berlin Film Festival. I've not not seen any reviews, but I, I believe it's already been bought. I believe somebody's already picked it up. I've got a feeling I might be to- I might be talking out of my hat now, but I've got a feeling maybe should have bought it straight away. But, yeah. yeah. Black I mean, I know, sunglasses. I know of it, and I finally watched the trailer a day or two ago. Mm. I just kind of stopped watching trailers because I just want to. I want to go on fresh. The oh, fair but, enough. Fair enough. But but I said, yeah, what the heck? I, I want to ask a couple of sort of general questions about your relationship to horror music as well, and sort of. Uh, um, so so one question was, uh, I'd like to know: Is there a score that you really love, which? isn't the, the the film doesn't quite live up to that you know you think oh this is a i love the music to the film and the film's film's okay but not i think the, the first one that popped into my head was the dark half which was a george romero movie uh because i just love christopher young's score for that chris uh is just so talented he's probably best known for doing hellraiser and hellbound hellraiser 2 but he's worked in all genres he works sometimes with Sam Raimi. He did Spider-Man 3. I love his score for Drag Me to Hell, which is probably one of my favorite scores he ever did. He's just, he's such a brilliant orchestral composer and he loves doing the synth stuff and he kind of wants to do more than that, more of that kind of stuff. But the dark half, and then talking to Chris, I learned that there was just a lot of issues with that movie. You know, uh, uh, Romero wasn't well for some of it and he departed the project, you know, before post-production and, there was stuff that wasn't finished. So I don't, th- and, and I, and I do like the movie. There are things about it that I, I like a lot, but I think when you watch it and you, after you hear about the kind of problems that it had, you can kind of see that this could have been so much better than it, that it ended up being, even though, like I said, I mean, I'm not, not I'm not knocking <laughs> George Romero or the film. Just some, sometimes films just don't live up to their potential. And I think that's one of them. And I think there were reasons that are outside of Romero's uh, control for that. And even Chris talks about he doesn't really love the score because he doesn't feel like he ever got to finish it because the movie was like never really finished. And so he never really got to do everything he wanted to do with it. But what he does for that, what the, the stuff he did do for that movie, I think is gorgeous. And I always kind of say in a lot of ways, I think Chris was 
he was the Danny Elfman before Danny Elfman, because a lot of the stuff that we equate with Danny Elfman sound, the chorus, stuff like that, is stuff that Chris had been doing since Hellraiser and before. And I, his stuff for Dark Half, I would think some people would think is very Elfman-esque, but uh, it's also at the same time so quintessentially Chris Young. <laughs> Uh, and I just, I just think it's a gorgeous score, and I think that film, unfortunately, just doesn't live up to to the, how gorgeous that music really is. Brilliant. That's that's one I can put on my my uh, my to be listened to list. Another question I wanted to ask is: we you were talking earlier on about the uh, sort of the a, a golden age of horror, you know, sort of late eighties, early nineties, when when you could get these video cassettes of, of the, these films and. Uh, and, and watch them but in recent years there see, there's been an absolute renaissance in horror you know there's been you know we've had j horror and loads of stuff coming out of um different cultures and different countries and then we've had this sort of jordan peele um uh, ari Aster, um to some degree eggers uh, i would put in that thing but you, you, an absolute explosion of, of really interesting horror do you think there that those um new horror films are sort of approaching music differently as well? It's a, that's an interesting question that I never really thought about. I think musical styles change. And I think that is also clear with film music. I think a lot of horror film music in the last 20 years, and this is a general statement, and obviously there's exceptions to every role, but I think generally speaking, especially even in the last 10 years is less melodic and more about atmosphere. And I think that stretches to even non-horror films, but I think it's really uh, clear in horror films to uh, Joseph Bashara, who is in the first, who I interviewed for the first book. And he's, he did the, he's done the conjuring movies and the insidious movies. And there are melodic score uh pieces and a lot of that stuff but his the stuff that works best in in his scores is just like this wall of sound that is just uh bone chittle chilling blood curdling <laughs> you know there's uh, I, I i've told him that uh you know when i saw insidious there were cues that when they hit they were so on the money that i they made me laugh and I and I said, you know, and that's not because that was funny or they didn't work. I, I'm someone that, you know, when I w go to see a, a band and a guitar player just shreds and it's just like he hits everything and it's just so perfect. Like it, joy comes out of me and laughter uh, when I when I used to go see Tom Petty and when Mike Campbell would take a solo and like American Girl and he'd start doing the chicken picking stuff. And it was just like it was so good that I just couldn't contain myself. And that's the way I, I kind of I found myself laughing at cues in the insidious because they just like they were so perfect. And but a lot of his stuff is just very atmospheric. And you see that you see a lot of that stuff in the Ari Aster films. I feel like that's Obviously, atmosphere is big, has always been a big thing in horror, and I think just the way people approach it is different now. I mean, clearly, the way John Carpenter does and did and does atmosphere is very different than the way, you know, Joseph Bashar does, who just assaults you with, you know, it's actually very... Uh, akin to some of the Suspiria stuff. When you get past the, you know, the theme and you start to hear the cues like witch, witches, and there's just, they just bombard you with screaming, wailing vocals and sound. So it's not like it's new. I just feel like that stuff kind of stuff gets used more. And the technology changes things. You know, they all talk about how uh, now they have to mock up things, which is basically what they do for directors is they do the entire score in the computer even if it's an orchestral score, because the directors are just like, used to hearing it the way, you know, so they have to, they actually have to like kind of complete the score ahead of time in a way that could be used in the movie and then go and record it again with an orchestra when they're doing an orchestral score. At budgets have, I think are less, uh, time is probably less uh, for the most part. So I think a lot of that, uh, I think also, you know, it comes across in the style. They just have less time and less money to work with. I was listening to um, Hans Zimmer's uh, score for Dune recently, and that you'd, you'd be hard put to find a melody in that. You know, it's it's just 
a kind of persistent ambient drone you know i don't mean that in a bad way necessarily no no but but that's what it is it's just like if 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 you go you know how there's youtube videos of ambient soundscapes and i found the one for june and it's just the soundtrack it's just it's like <laughs> absolutely no different from the soundtrack because it's- yeah they just i think when i talk to some of the older composers or more seasoned more experienced composers uh, about these kinds of things. They always kind of say like the way they did it in the seventies and eighties, those more melodic scores are thought of as being old fashioned. Uh, And, you know, there's so much homage and, uh, and uh, it's the word I'm looking for nostalgia in film that you, we do get some of that kind of, we used to, you know, stranger things is a perfect example, you know, so we do get some of that kind of what is now considered old fashioned scoring, but it's usually in the, in a way of harkening back to things that we're nostalgic for, you know, people ask me these kinds of questions all the time. They ask me about, you know, like the Marvel movies and, and, I, and what I think about those scores. And they say, you know, like, I can't remember what they sound like or whatever, but so well, it's hard to say because I'm not, you know, eight when I'm seeing these movies. Like I was when I saw Star Wars and, <laughs> you know, Indiana Jones and, you know, maybe kids that are seeing them now, those are going to be the scores that they love as adults. We're not seeing them now. Uh, Jay Chataway talks a lot about, and it, it's something that comes up a lot, but he, I think, puts it best in the first book where he talks about, uh, we talk a lot about temp scores, temporary scores. And that something was kind of always done, but is is really always done now, which is the editor uses pre-existing cues in the editing for rhythm because they're going to show it to potential investors and they can't show it without music. And then the composer is given a cut of the movie and it has this temporary score on it. Sometimes it's cues they've written. Sometimes it's not often it's not. And they're kind of asked to do that. <laughs> get as close to that as sometimes as close to that they, they talk about temp love which is when they cannot write something that satisfies the filmmakers the producer and the director enough as the piece of music that's already in there now what jay chataway talks about in the interview in his interview is that now because it's such a it's a practice that everybody uses everybody's temping with the same music so when everybody's temping with the same music the scores all start to sound the same because they're all striving for the same thing. I, I, I think there's some truth to that. I don't know how extreme it is, probably not in practice as extreme as some of them kind of attributed to, I think, but uh, it makes sense. And, uh, but when you, when you get one, you know, Marvel movie, there's Marvel movies coming out every year. It's a cinematic universe. And I would imagine that there is some talk about continuity in sound So we do get a lot of stuff that kind of sounds the same. And because melodic scores are not quite as popular nowadays as they used to be, they might not be as memorable as they are in the long run. I talked to, for my podcast, I talked to Bill Conti, who's one of my favorite composers of all time. Rocky is my favorite movie. And he did did the Rocky score. He did all the Rocky scores except for number four, which I also love that score by Vince DiCola. Just it's a very different beast. He did Karate Kid, which is also a movie and a score that I love. And so he's not known for horror movies. But after I did two books on it, you know, I was like, well, I'm not just interested in horror movie music. <laughs> but he also did do a score for a horror film called Nomads that I just, I, I love that movie. It's with it's Pierce Brosnan's first movie. And it was John, maybe John McTiernan's first like feature film and it's a really interesting film so he did do a horror movie we do talk about that but i talked to him about because his scores are obviously so melodic and he's coming from the from the 70s and into the 80s he i think he won the academy award for the right stuff and uh but also he has a he has a he had a unique position in that for many years he was the conductor of the orchestra at the academy awards and when you watch the academy awards you hear one some of the great film scores of all time, but specifically the, the film scores, film the most popular themes of that year. So I said, you know, you've been in this unique position where you've you've conducted for a decade <laughs> more the popular films. And so I said, do you find that that things have changed over the years the way uh, 
music is written. And he's the one that said, you know, look, there's trends like anything else. And he's the one that kind of pointed out that just, just the things are just not as melodic. And that's something that obviously I think you can hear yourself. And I talked to it with some of the other guys uh, in the books, but uh, yeah, it's just, things are different now. Har- and horror is no, and horror isn't different either in, in terms of, you know, f- film music fills a lot of jobs in cinema. And some of them are unique. And in horror, some of the things that it does are unique to horror. But ultimately, the, that was one of the things that really came cl- became clear to me when I was interviewing these guys. Is like music does so many things within a movie. Because even as a fan of horror, of film music in general, and you listen to it and you appreciate it, you don't really, as a fan normally, unless you're a certain type of person, and I wasn't, really analyze how it's working and what it's doing. It you know, there are things where it, they call back to earlier things in the movie that, you know, it's almost like a flashback, but when you hear a certain melody of a character that died, you know, earlier in the movie, it can, it emotionally, it's like the emotional element of, of the movie. Uh, and so it does everything from calling back to earlier things in obviously atmosphere, the jump scares are a big thing in horror. There's just so many things that it does. And so in a, in a lot of ways, that kind of stuff doesn't change because there are certain jobs that it has, but how it approaches those jobs, some, those, how it does those jobs or sometimes does change. And uh, this is a really long-winded answer for what you're, for a very simple question. It's all right. When I, when I edit it, it'll just be like you going, yep, yeah, you're right, John. <laughs> uh, I'm joking. But also, uh, you know, you, you brought up, you know, Asian horror uh, as being something that's, you know, more of a, now it's been 20 years, but it can more of a contemporary style of horror. And I was lucky enough in the second book to interview two uh, Japanese composers, Kenji Kawai and uh, Koji Endo, because like I said earlier with the second book, part of my mission was like, what can I do with the second book that I didn't do at the first one? And I was mostly American composers, but there was some Italian composers in the first books. What's the other really important version of horror you know uh, culturally regionally that i should talk to and obviously asian horror came to mind at the time and so i reached out it was very hard getting those interviews and, and conducting those interviews were very difficult because of the language barrier and so those interviews feel very different in the book they're a lot shorter but again you know i take pride in the fact that i have maybe the only two interviews with those guys in english <laughs> that you'll be able to find but also the what became clear in those interviews even though they were short and i couldn't talk to them the way i did a lot of the other most of the other composers there's a cultural difference obviously in life and that comes across in the movies and how they approach the music and so those kinds of things change so i mean it's it's all stuff i guess why this is such a long-winded answer is because it's there's it's all stuff that as a listener you can't typically put your finger on because in the best case scenario in films you, one could argue the best scores are the ones you never hear because you're so they're working in a way that you're so involved in the narrative of the movie that you it's so so much a part of it that you don't recognize that it's playing and even if you do it's taking you on this emotional journey and you're not thinking about it technically or scholarly you, you're just accepting it and the way music works in movies in so many ways, but the, the, that emotional level, I think when it's working, you would never know what's different because ultimately it's all, like I said, they're all trying to fulfill certain goals in their jobs. And some of those jobs are akin to all genres or specific to every genre, but if they're doing it right, who cares how they get there? Sure. Sure. What, what about, okay. This, that leads on to my, my another question. Which is, is there a score that you, that you, listening to separately from the film, you find really scary? That you, that, that it has that sort of effect on you, it chills you. What would, what would be sort of the scariest score? Well, that's a tough one. I mean, probably the stuff that is not melodic, you know, the things like Joseph Bashar's stuff and some of the Suspiria stuff. There's a film called Black Christmas, the original one, uh, 
Carl Zitcher. His, 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 his last name is spelled very oddly. I never know how to pronounce it. A lot of that is just like banging piano strings and stuff and and running things along them it's not music in any kind of conventional sense those kinds of things because they're so foreign to what the way we think about music that when i when you get those it's hard not to have some kind of visceral reaction even if it's not even if it's not like because it's reminding you of the movie you know a lot of the scores like rocky for instance like i can literally cry listening to that score but it's because my emotions to that music are so tied to that movie and that story the the last cues of that score like i literally could just listen to that album and cry because it's so tied in this we're talking about music uh quote unquote music that doesn't even need that doesn't need that emotional response that that connection it's it in itself is so viscerally kind of disturbing that it literally like attacks you attacks your ears in a way that that conventional music kind of doesn't uh i chris young is working on a project right now that i can't talk too much about because i you know hasn't announced or everything but it's not a, a film it's more of a kind of a retrospective thing and he and he asked me to listen to a, a bunch of things for him and some of it is like that. There's stuff that he wrote for Invaders from Mars that I don't think gets used in the movie. I think it, it got, they didn't like it. It got rejected. Uh, but when he gets more synthy, when Chris Young does more synthesized stuff, things like uh, Sinister, Empty Man is a more recent film that he, he did. When he gets, when he works in synth, he gets very kind of out there and it is very like visceral and I told him, I said, look, you know, this is not my kind of music. This is like, I would listen to this once because you did it. And I, and it does take me on a journey in, in its own right, but it's not a journey I want to go on often. <laughs> no, I mean, but there are loads of films that do that. There are some of my favorite films I never want to see again. And it's not because they're, well, some of them are, it is because they're, they're, you know, they take me to, to into two dark places. I don't know, Son of Saul, for instance, or uh, Michael Haneke's Amour, I wouldn't want to see again. Gaspar Noé's Ir Irreversible, I wouldn't want to see again. But even like a film like Blue is a Warmest Color, which is a beautiful film, which I really loved. I just, I had such a great time watching it the first time. It's just like, I, why would I watch it again? You know, and I, and I watch loads of films multiple, multiple, multiple times. But I don't know, some... Some films, you just, they're such a great experience. And the same thing with scores that sometimes, or pieces of music, you know, it's not, I mean, it's not inevitable that everything has to be repeated endlessly, you know, yeah. for you to appreciate it. Absolutely. I was thinking of uh, Howard Shaw music for Seven has, you know, you could listen to that outside of the film and it just has a relentless, mm, you know, that, that, that puts you in, in, the head of a serial killer and it's again it's not a comfortable place to be but it's very effective yeah i mean you know it's look music is it's music is one it's it's an interesting art form because it's invisible you know what i mean like we we don't experience it the way we do a painting a sculpture a, a, a movie even I mean, movies are interesting because it's it's a it's a collaborative art form that encompasses so many different art forms to make one end product from set design to cinematography to music to acting it's like the ultimate art form in a lot of ways because it's the culmination of of all these great art forms but music is you know spoken word i guess would be one that you experience you know just sonically but there aren't many and so it i feel like it it must you must experience it through on a, like a different part of your brain than you do other things and you know you can you can look at a painting and have a, an emotional response to it but i don't feel like it's ever going to be as unless you have unless it really does like sense memory some experience that you had and you look at it and it's like it reminds you of your mother who passed away or whatever like obviously you could have very profound emotional responses to visual art but music i think does it it, it attacks you in a different way emotionally and it's 
it's very mathematical, you know, uh, in a way that I don't understand, you know, uh, it, it's its own language. You know, these guys, the reason why I was so afraid that I what might not be the guy to write these books is because I don't, I'm not fluent in the language that these guys are speaking. Ultimately, I found a way in and most of them teach. So there were, when I didn't understand something, I could say, can you explain that in layman's terms? And we could talk about it and they could explain it in a way that I felt most readers would understand. That was kind of my goal. I discovered like, yeah, maybe I don't talk that language, but they also speak my language. And so, you know, maybe I can find a nice balance where this book can be informative to people who want to score movies and they can get a lot out of it. But people who just love film music or love horror movies can read it and they can understand it and get something out of it, too. But music is, you know, it's such whether it's a pop song and it has vocals or it's a piece of classical music, it's just it is an emotional thing i think for whether it makes us happy or it irritates the hell out of us because it's you know baby shark or whatever <laughs> or it's something like howard shore score for seven which i feel like in a lot of ways was kind of groundbreaking and that it did it might be one of those scores that ushered in this kind of scoring that we're talking about that's more uh relevant today and like I was saying with the movies, like that's kind of what it does for the movies. I mean, you know, they all explain how, what it does. Cause I ask most, if not all of them, like, what is your job or what does film music do? Uh, and, you know, Harry, Harry Manfredini, I don't know why he's the one guy that keeps coming up in this conversation when there's 30 guys. Uh, but like his, he, one of his things was, you know, as a film music composer, you're a dramatist, you're, you know, you're doing everything for the movie that the picture isn't already doing. And, you know, and some of them also, the, the emotional content is stuff. And we talk about uh, with Tom Hodgdu, who is the part of the writing team of Tom and Andy. He talks about like passive music versus uh, active music. And it's just, it, it's a long and short of it is like, you know, one of the, the, the big revelation to me was how many things it does. But at the end of the day, it's really about emotion. And even though the emotion they're trying, they're often trying to achieve in horror movies isn't comedy or, you know, isn't happiness or <laughs> romanticism or it, it's, they're trying to scare you. But at the same time, you get a score like, Richard Band's score for uh, House on Sorority Row, which I talk about with Richard in the second book. And that's a score that is just gorgeous. It's this lush orchestra. It's a waltz, uh, you know, just the, just the way Hellraiser is with Christopher Young. And, you know, that main theme, it's just like this very dark waltz. Whereas if you heard Richard Band's score for, uh, aside from some of the actual, like, suspense scenes but if you heard some of those themes you would never imagine that those are for a, a pretty average in the word but a pretty typical slasher movie of the early 80s and like that was also a job that i you know i said you know what in listening to his stuff was of this revelation of like one of the things that film music can do is add production value a gravitas to a movie that isn't there. Look, House of Sorority Row, perfectly fine slasher movie of, you know, during a time of slasher movies. But if you put, you know, the Prowler's score, which is a great score and a great slasher movie score on House of Sorority Row, it becomes something very different than what Richard does with it. And Richard adds this weight to it and it makes it feel important in a way that another score, another score just wouldn't do. That's, that sounds almost like the answer to the to the question earlier about the dark half as well. It sounds like that's, that, you know, you really appreciate the score. And the film's okay, but the score is... Yeah, really... yeah, that was that's another kind of perfect example. Because yeah. I just love that score, but it... Mm. I like the movie, but the, my love for that score has nothing to do with the movie. <laughs> it has everything to do with what Richard Band brought to that score. I, I, I really love the, the score for uh, 
Tron legacy. And, um, yeah. and you know, I mean, the film's pretty... I, I mean, I've watched it once. I have no intention of watching it again, but I've got that score on my uh, playlist, you know. Uh, right, listen, uh, Blake, I've got to ask you a final question, which is, uh, can you recommend a film book for us? Uh, there is no limit, except you're not allowed to recommend your own film book. Because yes. <laughs> this whole podcast is a recommendation for your film book. Yeah. Um, you know, I kind of thought long and hard. This was the one question you gave me ahead of time. So I thought long and hard about this. Mostly what I read in my spare time for enjoyment are films on, are books on film and also, you know, like biographies on musicians. Like those are the kind of nonfiction stuff is what I, so there's, you know, there was a lot of, there were a lot of books that, that, that I could choose here. And I don't even think that the, maybe the book I'm going to mention is kind of relevant now, the way it was when I read it. Uh, you know, I, I talked about how I was a teenager in the mid nineties and how I made a lot of movies with my friends on VHS. And I was kind of the perfect age for that early to mid nineties independent film boom of Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez, Kevin Smith, all that kind of stuff. And it was because of those, even though most of those movies aren't necessarily films that I, I still love today, uh, I do have to attribute that the fact that I got into wanting to make movies and even this book in a way because of those movies. So there was a book that I read when I was, I don't know, 15 or 16. And, and there has since been an updated version. Uh, but it was a book called uh, King of Paul, The Wild World of Quentin Tarantino by Paul A. Woods. And I read it just after Pulp Fiction. And like I said, I think there's an updated version that goes through maybe Jackie Brown. And Quentin Tarantino is definitely not a filmmaker that I have continued to be as passionate about as I was when I discovered you know, Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. Uh, but what was great about that book is it was in a lot of ways a biography, but in, a, in most ways it was a biography through the movies that he liked and influenced him. And for a kid in the mid nineties without the internet before Google and all this stuff that you now, like I guess I say, I don't know if it's relevant now because People know things and it's easy to find this information, but it was flipping through the pages of that book and reading that, that book that you know, it was like, he talked about Lucio Fulci and it was like, what is this crazy movie he's talking about where a zombie wrestles a shark underwater, <laughs> you know, and he talks about Dario Argento and he talks about Sonny Chiba, uh, you know, so all these things that I still love today, I kind of discovered through reading that book. And I remember being in New York City when I was in film school and being in a video store and seeing Zombie at a video store. I'm like, oh, that's the, that's the movie from that Quentin Tarantino book with the zombie wrestles a shark. And I bought it. And so like, and then instantly fell in love with that score. So uh, for me, it was a very important book. Uh, I don't know if people today will take away from it the kinds of things that I took away from it you know, 20 plus years ago. But uh, to me, it was kind of quintessential and it, it probably maybe impacted me and influenced me uh, more profoundly than uh, most film books because of when I wrote, read it and, and what access I had to things. It was kind of in a way a Bible to what would later be the films that I do really love. Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, I I've got the same sort of film education where I'm, I, I was picking up books about, I remember there being a book I got from Barrow and Furnace Library called Midnight Movie Madness or something like that. It was just like a, you know, alphabetically organized with little blurbs of, of what they considered sort of midnight cult movies. And so many movies were, were totally unavailable. You know, you just couldn't find them anywhere, but even today, I will come across a film and think, oh, I read about this in midnight, you know, when I, was, when I was 13 years old, I read about this, I want to see this, you know, and that's, uh, you know, I think those are, those are great things, and I, I hope people still still have some experience of that, because it's like, I mean, the clickbaity al uh, article that says, you know, the top 10 such and such movies ranked best to worst or whatever, it just doesn't quite get my juices flowing in the same way. 
Yeah. Well, you know, the, and I talk about this in the introductions to both books, like kind of the way the internet and everything changed the way we learn about things. And as great as it all is, you know, it united us virtually as fans that we never had before. And you learned through that. And then you have all these starting with Anchor Bay in the late nineties onto Blue Underground with Bill Lustig, who worked at Anchor Bay. And then now Shout Factory and Scream Factory and uh, Severin and all these great things that are making things available. But there was a beauty to the hunt that people will that people these days will never really know there was like reading about a book reading about a movie in a book and then five years later be like holy cow this is that movie you know this is that one uh and <laughs> and then, <laughs> and stumbling upon it in a in a CD books uh, movie store in in Manhattan, you know it's there's it's a very different thing. And a lot of the scores when I got in Italian movies, a lot of those scores were I had they were they were a hunt. It was uh, finding them in in weird record stores, going to horror conventions, going on mess before Facebook and all that, going on message boards. And saying like, hey, does anybody have this? And then like literally sending them a blank cassette so that they could tape it for you. And then later CDRs, sending things to Italy so that they would send stuff back to me. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to stop this because at some point we're going to start going, oh, the kids today, they don't know the <laughs> Listen, Blake. Thank you so much for uh, for agreeing to talk to me. Uh, it, I I think your books will. Uh, they look. They got me. I was I was flipping through my my Spotify. I know I shouldn't use Spotify anymore, but anyway, I was a a music service. I was flipping through and I was putting in names and listening to stuff as I was reading the book. So it was getting me into a, a, a new education. I knew I knew some of it, but I sure. certainly nothing like the breadth of knowledge and depth of knowledge that you have so thanks so much Blake yeah I really appreciate it you know it's it's always fun to talk about this kind of stuff with people and share my work and with people that maybe don't know about it because ultimately the books are not I always I think of the books as they're mine but they're ours they're me and the composer's books and they're not about me uh they're about them and there are people, and one of the main goals for them was to bring awareness and kind of celebrate these people. And so uh, to be able to promote them to people that might not know it, might not follow me on Twitter or whatever, might not even be horror movie fans, but know that the book, but now know that the books are not just about horror. You know, it's, it's really about sending the message that these kinds of people and specifically these people but film music in, in general is such a wonderful thing and, and though more recognized today than maybe ever before still not as recognized as maybe it should be so i appreciate the uh, opportunity to kind of spread the word and celebrate these composers with uh, you and your audience brilliant thank you blake where could, by the way where could listeners uh, follow you on twitter what's your uh, handle well on twitter facebook instagram i'm, I'm at scored to death and uh, the books are available on Amazon as in the uh, ebook and paperback, other book retailers as well. Or if people are interested in uh, getting a signed copy, especially if you're in the US because shipping is a, a big pain in the butt uh, cost wise, uh, you can order books directly from me at scoredtodeath.com. So that was my conversation with Blake. I hope you enjoyed it. It certainly got me going through my playlist and listening to some Goblin and some other composers. Thanks go to Elia Atkins for the music, Ali Howard for the art, and thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week. <laughs>